We may not even need a message today. That was, that was blessing enough. <laughs> I think I see a conga line. I see all sorts of things. Well, <laughs> all right. Well, it is good uh, to be together studying the word of God. Um, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we just come before you this morning and we thank you for the joy that is in this place. Um, joy is definitely from you. And um, we thank you for that. We thank you for the sunshine. We thank you for each person here and the family that they represent. And Holy Spirit, we just invite you into this place that everything spoken is for your glory, for the kingdom of God. And whatever it is that we are carrying, whatever we are burdened with, we just lay that at your feet and ask you to take up those spaces and do what only you can do. We know you love us, and we know even the things that are hard that we go through are meant to draw us closer to you. So we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. So have you ever tried to have a conversation with someone, but you can tell that they aren't really listening to you? And you know this because their mouth is poised in that half-open position, just at the ready so that when you pause or take a breath even, they can jump in on that millisecond moment as their opportunity to tell you what they think. Or they just talk over you. They have answers and opinions on all of the things they were certain you were going to say had you been able to finish your sentence. See, Paul is writing his letter to the Romans as if he is in a situation like that. See, he has addressed some big things in the first chapter specific to the Gentiles, but yet relevant to all of mankind, and that is this deep-seated rebellion, sin, that impacts every part of our lives and our relationships. And he's, as he's addressing these things, he's doing it with the goal of unity in the church, rooted in the righteousness of God between these very different groups of people. But it's as if with every line the religious reader reads, their mouths are half open, ready to respond with things like, we know we should love the Gentiles, Paul. But have you seen the things they've done? They're pagans. They're just brutal pagans. We were raised with religion. We have the word of God, this rich heritage. What do they bring to the table? What do they bring to the church? So then Paul took time to tell them that the way that they're reflecting religion back to the world, well, that's part of the problem. Because knowing the law in your mind, but then contradicting it with your actions, puts a negative light on God. And then he outlined how their judgmentalism was boomeranging back on them through his audit of the hypocrisy in their lives. See, Paul has been a disciple of Jesus for over 20 years at this point. And with all that he had seen and all that he had endured, walked through, there just wasn't a whole lot that intimidated or shocked him. And that's especially because he looked at life like the only loss that he could face would be not using his time wisely. He wasn't hoping to gain anything other than the chance to preach the gospel. So as a result, as long as he was speaking the truth, he didn't care what other people thought about him. He had nothing to lose from that perspective. So he's bold in talking about the things that are separating people, especially the religious people, from a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And one of their greatest barriers was using their religion as a weapon on other people and as a guarantee for themselves. So you might be sitting here thinking, well, wait a second, like, isn't Christianity religion? Isn't all church stuff religion? Well, no, not by God's design. And that is exactly what Paul is trying to clear up. And this is a really important point because what he's doing is he's drawing a distinction between religion 
and the gospel message of Jesus Christ. So some people will miss heaven by 18 inches. Remember, we said that when we studied James, the distance between their head and their heart. Relationships are a matter of the heart. And as we will see as we continue this morning, we don't naturally set the standards of Jesus before us as our standards. That is not in our human nature to do. So therefore, the love of God is not naturally in us as a result of our human nature. His love is only there because it has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And Paul will go on to talk about that in Romans 5. So when the Holy Spirit is having its way in our lives, we live according to God's standards. That's why the Holy Spirit is a vital component of our walk with Jesus. And that's exactly why Jesus wants us to know him on that level, on the heart level. Not just have knowledge of him, those things can draw us to him, of course, but he wants us to be transformed by his love. So if we look at God only through the lens of religion or steps to follow, we miss the relationship, and well, the gospel, it just oozes relationship. So a few months ago, we gave you guys a picture of the armor of God, where each piece of the armor was outlined and explained. And today we're going to give you another picture, and that is of the difference between religion and relationship, or religion and the gospel. And this is taken directly from Tim Keller. I'm sorry it's a little small. You might need to pop some glasses on your head when you read it. Um, but it's taken directly from Tim Keller, who wrote a book on Romans, and he was able to powerfully contrast the difference between living a merely religious life, which is dependent on our performance, with the performance of Christ for us, <laughs> allowing us a life filled with the promises and the truth and the blessing of the gospel. So we're going to go over a couple of these quickly because it gets to the heart of what Paul is desiring to accomplish in his letter to the Romans. And Kate is going to have um, them up on the screen. We're not going to go over all of them, but we wanted you to have one to take home and look over in the comfort of your own space. I would encourage you to do that. Um, but we're going to go ahead and take a look at the first five or five of them. So on the religion side, someone might say, I obey, therefore... I'm accepted. But the gospel says, no, I'm accepted. Therefore, I obey. Therefore, I want to obey. All right, the next one. On the religious side, it says motivation is based on fear and insecurity. The gospel is like, nope, motivation is actually based on grateful joy. Religion says, I obey God in order to get things from God. Where the gospel says, no, I obey to get God to get God, to delight, and then therefore look more like him, to resemble him. All right, the next one. Religion says, when I'm criticized, I'm furious or I'm devastated because it's essential for me to think of myself as a good person. Threats to that self-image, well, that has to be destroyed. The gospel says, when I'm criticized, yeah, I struggle. But it isn't essential for me to think of myself as a good person because my identity isn't built on my performance, but on God's love for me in Christ Jesus. And the last one. My prayer life consists largely of petition, so asking for things. And it only heats up when I'm in need. My main purpose in prayer is to control circumstances of life. And the gospel says my prayer life consists of generous stretches of praise and adoration. My main purpose is fellowship with him. That's the difference between religion and the gospel. See, the gospel, it's the message that says, because we can't save ourselves, God sent Jesus. That is the power of God unto salvation, and that is where ultimate freedom and peace can be found. 
See, religion in and of itself, well, it can actually stand in the way of us seeing Jesus. And as far as fixing the problem of our sinfulness, which you think about it at its core, our sin is rooted in pride, it's rooted in rebellion, and ultimate independence from God. So religion on its own can cater to those things and even make them worse, but in a backwards sort of way, but still elevating you over rather than humbling you to. So as we step forward into chapter 3, Paul, having been the Pharisee of Pharisees, a Jew himself, a rabbi, a teacher of the law, as he writes what he writes, he understands that this objection is coming. Another objection is going to be raised. He's addressed the Gentiles. He has addressed the Jew. Today, in the first eight verses, he's going to conclude his address to the religious Jews specifically, and then he's going to move to the believer, whether they're Gentile, Greek, or Jew. So he does something pretty awesome. I think it's really creative. He writes out this argument, and it's written like a mini play where Paul plays both sides. What the religious person would say and then his response to them. Now, as studiers of Paul's letter, it is definitely within our nature to try and tenderize what Paul is saying, like soften it up a little bit, um, touch on the really hard stuff, kind of like we're running across hot coals, like, ooh, ah, ah, you know, did it, done, over, all right. We read the verses, <laughs> we're good. Um, but the truth is, and I'm just going to be really honest with you, Paul makes a very, very strong case about religion and the gospel. And he does this very strongly by hitting mankind hard because it's imperative to the reader of his time and the readers of all times to come what the gospel of Jesus actually accomplished and can continue to accomplish in people's life. But if you don't think you need Jesus, well, then what's the point? So Paul really goes for the high, I would say the jugular, um, as he addresses what mankind is really like apart from God. Um, let's take a look at Romans 3, verses 1 through 2. And these are like written like questions and then answers. So the first question asked that he's proposing in his mock play is what advantage does the Jew have? Or what is the benefit of circumcision? And the answer is, well, considerable in every way. First, they were entrusted with the very words of God. God himself inspired the Bible word for word, and the purpose of the Bible was that through the events shared, through the rituals performed, that Israel would be pointed to Jesus to highlight their immense need for him. It wasn't made to make them self-sufficient and eliminate their need for Jesus because they followed the law, because they followed the steps. And this is a really important point that Paul is making. The rituals that were done, they weren't meant to elevate them above other people, but humble them before God, bring them to a place where they're like, oh my goodness, I need the saving grace of Jesus. What you do is meant to draw you to. So the next question asked is, what then? If some were unfaithful, will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? And the answer, absolutely not. Let God be true, even though everyone is a liar, as it's written, that you may be justified in your words and triumph when you judge. So Paul is imagining the Jewish religious person saying, okay, so if the law was supposed to lead us to Jesus, hasn't the faithfulness of God failed? Since as you well know, so many Jews haven't yet believed the gospel. And Paul's like, that's ridiculous. Even though Israel, not entirely but largely, failed to believe God, God still kept his promise to bring salvation, and God did something even better. He took Israel's unbelief and he turned that into an opportunity for the Gentiles to also receive the gift of salvation. So, on the contrary, this demonstrates an even greater level of faithfulness on God's part. 
So verses 5 through 7, the third question. But if our unrighteousness highlights God's righteousness, what are we to say? I'm using a human argument. Is God unrighteous to inflict wrath? The answer, absolutely not. Otherwise, how will God judge the world? So then this little follow-up question. See if you can find yourself in this. But if by my lie, God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I also being judged as a sinner? So Paul is outlining this Jewish person asking, how can God be mad at the Jews then? Didn't they just play their part in getting the gospel message to the Gentiles? Oh, that's so sassy. And God's answer is, or Paul's answer is basically, that's also a ridiculous thing to say. Each person is responsible and accountable for their own actions, regardless of how amazing it is that God can use our human choices, good or bad, to accomplish his sovereign will. We are still held accountable for our own actions and lack of actions. So this reminds me of a time when our son Hunter was about four, and I think I might have shared this here, but he had to sit in a timeout, and he left his timeout spot to ask me this profound question. He said, if Jesus already paid the price for my sins, why do I have to be punished too? To which I just stared at him, rapidly blinking my eyeballs. <laughs> Like, uh, and I remember you were in the bathroom, and I'm like, what are we going to do? Um, <laughs> to which I just kind of responded like, you know, yes, you're right, but there are earthly consequences here. Go back in your time out. All the while, I'm thinking, I am in, like, deep doo-doo raising this one because he's smarter than I am at four. <laughs> so Paul ends this little anticipated question and answer session concluding with a question, the believer specifically, regardless of being a Jew or a Gentile, might ask, and this is Romans 3.9. The question is, what then? Are we any better off? And the answer is not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. The Gentiles are guilty before God because they have a conscience. They have a moral compass given to them by God, whether they recognize that or not. And the Jew, they have the law, the word of God. So the we is referring specifically to the person reading Paul's letter, the believer. His point being, just because you are a believer does not mean that you are not accountable to the reality of the sinfulness in your own life. So what Paul does next is he runs through a series of quotes from the Old Testament. And these quotes are all put together to demonstrate the state of our heart without God. Specifically using the Old Testament to say, hey, this is nothing new. This has always been what the scriptures have been trying to teach you. And through the Old Testament scriptures, Paul, as if he's in a court setting, he brings 13 counts against mankind through this comprehensive list that I'm sorry not one of us can escape. And doing this, it was actually an old rabbinic tactic, and it was called a shiraz. And shiraz means a string of pearls. The rabbis would string together pearls of truth, that perfectly prove a point using scriptures. So that's what Paul's doing in this list of 13 counts. He's providing this full necklace of spiritual indictment about mankind. And through it, he breaks mankind down, apart from God, into three categories. The first is what we are like on the inside, so our character. The next is what we say, which is really our heart. And then the third is what we do, so the totality of man. So let's take a look at what we are like 
on the inside. Verse 10. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. Well, that's pretty blunt. Um, As it is written. So another way to look at that phrase would be to say, it has been true, and it is still continuously true. So as it is written, it's said in the perfect tense in the Greek language. And the perfect tense identifies something that happened in past tense time with continuing effect, continuing significance. So as it is written, this has always been the case. And that is the perfect definition, really, of all of Scripture. It's something that did happen, it's something that continues to happen, and it has the same powerful effect. It is permanent, it is forever. God's word is not in the past, it's forever. So there is no one righteous, not even one. And this is taken from the opening line in Psalm 114. The book of Romans, remember, is all about how to be right with God. And we cannot do that without the grace of God's righteousness in our lives. Not even by following the law, by doing good works, following the steps. It has to start with our heart, not our hands. Our hands should be a reflection of our heart. See, we like to measure our righteousness by our standards. We look better in our own eyes when we do that. And there is this relative level of human goodness. Of course, there is. Not all people are the very worst level of bad. There are also good people in the world, but no one is also at the very best level of good either, no matter how good they are. So by our standards, our human standards, our good is very good. But apart from God, our good can only be bad good. Because apart from God, our motives, well, they can't be in the right place. They seem good, but they can't reflect the heart of God. They can't be motivated by God if he's not in the picture. So apart from God, we're not able to be good good, because good good requires the righteousness of God. So verse 11, the first half, it says, there is none that understands. This is taken from Psalm 14, 2 and Psalm 53, 3. In our natural state as humans, we cannot comprehend the truth and the magnitude, the size and the depth of God. We don't have that reference point in our nature. So I remember being at my grandparents' house as a child, um, and they had a missionary from Africa staying with them. And it was raining, which was super exciting to this guy. But then it began to hail. And he ran outside, and he grabbed all of the pieces that he could, and he brought them into the house, and he just stared at them until they melted. He had heard of hail, but he had no point of reference for what it really was until he saw it and felt it and tasted it. He was eating the hail. The same is true for us and God. We need to see him in the ways that he works in our life. We need to feel his presence as we draw closer to him. The scriptures say, taste and see that the Lord is good. Even then, on this side of heaven, we cannot grasp the fullness of him because we don't have a point of reference for the totality of him. So there is none that understands. The second half of verse 11, there is no one who seeks God. The point here is that man doesn't naturally seek God. For a lot of people, what they see of God in creation, what they know of God, like the moral compass that they might have within themselves, through the conscious that he placed within them, that is as far as they go of seeking God, seeing him in the world. And this isn't being spoken in reference to seeking God in regard to salvation. It just means more that the center of our lives, the core of our lives, well, it's not naturally desiring God because we adore ourselves. That's the issue. 
We don't seek him above other things because we seek things for ourselves. So praying, surrendering to God, that isn't natural for us to do. And even the religious people, they can use their religion as a little g God of their own making for their own good. Hold those laws and rules over other people's heads so you look better. John the Baptist said in John 3.30, He must become greater, I must become less. We need to get out of the way so that God can do his best work in us and through us. We need to ask that the Holy Spirit fills us so that God can continue to communicate with his own nature within us. So just like this missionary from Africa, when we see God, we're going to know him and we're going to be forever changed because we've seen him. Our nature will lessen and his nature will increase because we're definitely going to want more of God and less of ourselves when we actually come face to face with the reality of him. Verse 12, the first half. All have turned away. All alike have become worthless. This is out of Psalm 14.3 again. Another way to say this would be, mankind's all gone off track. They're blinded by sin of the truth, with no interest in the glory of God. So the words turned away here, they translate with the same connotation as one fleeing a wild animal. That is how powerfully mankind has turned away from God, as if they're running from a big old bear and toward their own interests. So as a result, it says, if you're going to run away from God like that, Well, all have become worthless or useless. The Hebrew equivalent of the word useless is that of milk that has gone sour. Well, what do you do with that? You dump it, right? Um, Homer, in the Odyssey, he uses this word worthless with the connotation of the senseless laugh of a moron. Those are pretty harsh visuals. So all have turned away and become worthless. The second half of 12, there is no one who does what is good, not even one. So he reiterates verse 10, but just from a moral sense. And this derives from Psalm 53, 3, saying you can think you're X, Y, and Z. You're all this and All that, but apart from God, no one is capable of being good. So how are you feeling right now? (laughs) Such a lovely string of pearls that Paul is putting together for us to wear around our neck. Not really the pearls you want to show off, right? Feels maybe more like a boulder. Um, Paul is holding up a mirror the size of the world that when we look up, we all will find ourselves in. So there's a quote that I read that says, the slightest sin has an infinite amount of hatefulness in it, enough to outweigh whatever loveliness the creator possessed. Or Blaise Pascal, a French mathematician, religious philosopher, he said this, What a contradiction man is. On the one hand, judge of all things. On the other, a stupid earthworm, a depository of truth and a heap of error, the glory and refuse of the universe. I don't think that we'll find either one of those lovely sayings on a greeting card. So when you're looking for one for your mom this week, you know, try to avoid that section. Um, But having addressed our insides, our character, which I will tell you, that was a lot, Paul then moves on to what we say, what comes out of our mouth. Because as it is written in Matthew 12, out of the overflow of our heart, the mouth speaks. So we learn a lot about our heart by listening to our mouth. Verses 13 and 14. Their throat is an open grave, 
They deceive with their tongues. Vipers' venom is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. So this comes out of Psalm 140, Psalm 5, Psalm 10. James had a lot to say about the mouth, as we might recall. And the reason is because our corruption, the the place that it is most revealed is through our words. Our character might look really, really good until we open our mouth. Jesus said our words uttered in private are the best indicators of our heart. So consider your language. Consider your word usage from this past week, maybe this morning. Was there gossip? Was there anger? Were those little white lies present? Paul's saying our words carry the stench of death. Jesus said by our words alone, not our actions, our words alone, we would be condemned. So there was nothing more abominable in the ancient world than an open grave emitting that horrible stench of death. It's kind of ironic how we are so conscious and so concerned about having bad breath that we brush our teeth and we chew gum and we pop a mint in before a close conversation, yet without the righteousness of God, that's the reality of our words, of our mouth, this wretched stench. And the tense of the word used here is ongoing. It's not a one-time thing. It's an ongoing, continuous stink. He addresses viper's venom is under their lips. I did not know much about the viper snake. Um, if, If you do, congratulations. I had to do some research. But the viper's fangs, they actually fold back in the snake's mouth. They're tucked away in the upper jaw. But when it throws open its mouth to bite down on its victim, the fangs, which are hollow, they flip down. And then there is poison held in these secret sacs within their mouth. So when those hollow fangs pierce the the sac, the venom goes into the fang like a needle, and then it pierces into the victim. Our words are full of the venom of cursing and bitterness, just like that. Many wars in the home, wars among nations, have begun from words. The open grave of the mouth, releasing the stench of the heart, and then piercing the heart of the listener like those fangs. So just as our character... Who we are on the inside leads to what we say with our mouth. It should therefore be no surprise that both our character and our mouth are key players in how we act, what we do. And that's outlined in our last few verses of today's text. Verses 15 through 17. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and wretchedness are in their paths and the path of peace they have not known. This is from Isaiah 59. It's visible throughout all of history, really, the wake that mankind leaves. The connotation of the word ruin is that of glass shattering into bits. So when you leave a room and you leave a conversation with someone, is that how you envision leaving? If your words are not rooted in Jesus, do you look at your words shattering into bits, leaving destruction? The word wretchedness, it's similar to misery, but it refers specifically to physical suffering. And Paul's point is, sorry, that's the trail you're going to leave, not the path of peace. See, mankind says over and over, all we want is peace. We want peace. We want peace. But if our actions are not rooted in Jesus Christ, we will not experience lasting peace and we will not offer peace to other people. It is not within our nature to do that, but it is in God's. And it is something that we can experience because of the righteousness of God. Extended to us as a gift, received by faith, we do also receive peace. 
Paul has said a lot. And as I was going through this, I was like, wow, (laughs) that is intense. You know, we said week one we were going to need to put on our big girl and our big boy pants, that we were going to need to be humble and we were going to need to be willing to learn. Because Paul, fueled by the Holy Spirit, well, he was going to be bold in his desire to instruct. And I would say he absolutely has not disappointed. But he isn't going to drop all of this on us without bringing it all together. He's not going to be like, basically, these 13 things are what you are. I'm going to walk away now. Have a great day. Um, He's actually going to let us know the root cause for why we are the way we are, um, because then that provides hope, that provides an opportunity for us to change. So why is mankind like this? Well, verse 18 says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. This is out of Psalm 36. This is the reason we struggle. It's the reason we emit what we do to the world. We don't really fear God. That is not a natural thought in our mind. Proverbs 16 actually reverses this thought that says, one actually turns from evil by the fear of the Lord. So fearing God doesn't mean just fearing his judgment, which is important, but it's more deeply meaning having a respect for God, wanting to honor him because of who he is. Fearing God in the scriptures was a synonym for respect, having respect for his holiness, his work, and the will of the Lord. It's not having that sense of panic and wanting to flee like we talked about a few minutes ago, but rather having this reverence and awe and therefore wanting to sit at his feet because we understand that he gave more than we ever could give, allowing us to receive what we could never have had. So at the end of the day, what drives who you are What drives what you say, what drives what you do, is directly connected to the depth of respect that you have for God. When you draw near to God, his nature takes over within you, and that in turn affects each of these three areas, therefore enabling you to better reflect him, and this is the beautiful part, it happens naturally. So the last verse of today, verse 20, no one will be justified in his sight by the works of the law because the knowledge of sin comes through the law. Remember, Paul is talking predominantly to the Jewish believers. He's saying, hey, You can no longer justify the sin in your life because you claim to follow the law. Because through the law, you can see now the truth of your condition apart from God. The law is never going to justify or wipe clean your sin. Only Jesus can do that. It's impossible for us to comprehend really comprehend the glory of what the gospel message of Jesus Christ means without first comprehending the reality of who we are. We are all guilty. We are all in need of a Savior. And it doesn't matter if you've been a believer for 40 years or 100 years or three days. We are all guilty. We all need Jesus. And the really good news is He was provided for us, free of charge to us, certainly not to him. The reason why the sin in our life is addressed so strongly is because Jesus understands the cost. He bore it on his body for us. We really don't understand the cost. We get little snippets here and there of earthly consequences, but not the big picture cost. And Jesus is like, hey, I took care of it. 
All I need you to do is follow me. Follow after me. Not perfectly, but follow me. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are so very grateful for your word. I'm not going to stand here and say that that was easy, because that was not easy. It is a lot to take in. It's a lot to come face to face with the truth of who you are. And as believers specifically, we can absolutely look at the world and think that somehow we're better because we know you. And if we learned anything today, I pray that it is that, well, that's not true. The only way that we can be anything like what you want us to be is if we're completely out of the way. And if we're out of the way, we're not going to be comparing ourselves to other people. Lord, the things that you walk us through are not meant to shame us. They are meant to free us. The heaviness of what we might be feeling in this space today, I definitely ask that we do not walk out of here and just walk into the sunshine and just forget it all. I pray that we are willing to wrestle through whatever it is that you are placing on our heart. Maybe it is the way that we use our mouth. Maybe it is the, the way that we act, our character. Maybe it's all of it. But Lord, you have come to offer the greatest solution. And that is that we can come to you every single day, over and over again. Lord, we thank you, truly, truly thank you for the work that you did on the cross. None of this would matter. None of this would matter if you did not die for our sins. And so we come to this table with reverence. We come to this table with respect. And we come to this table with a heart that is grateful. You are so very good. We love you very much. Thank you for not giving up on us and holding our hand as we continue to learn. And it is in your name that we pray, Jesus. Amen. When you are ready, Ed, oh, actually, Tony and I, Michael and Tony, will administer the elements. When you think about those words, he has paid the highest price, and he has proven his great love for us. So if you're wondering if Jesus is trustworthy, if you're wondering if he is dependable, if you're wondering if you can surrender your yuck for his good, he definitely proved that on the cross. So take that with you this week. We love you guys. Oh, we are in this space next week as well. Um, if you can pop up a table or two, we still have to move things around, but come to Parish Hall next week too. All right, and bread. And bread.